Hello and welcome to another episode of the Omnibus Podcast, Minnesota's best source for political news inside and outside the Capitol. I'm your host, Jeremy Munson, a former state representative from Southern Minnesota, and with us as usual is Walter Hudson, representative from District 30A. Walter, uh, you've got a, a really uh, politically charged bill coming to the House floor for a vote, and this is a bill um, with Representative Finke, uh, this transgender guy in the Minnesota legislature that's been that's been writing really polarizing legislation. Um, a lot of people shook their heads when this was introduced because they didn't think it would get traction. Now it's past committees and it's coming to the House floor for a vote, and it creates a sanctuary state in Minnesota for transgender kids all across the country to come here and have uh, gender mutilation, have their breasts chopped off, uh, have sex changes, uh, get puberty blockers from doctors who in their states uh, won't do it because of uh, ethics and morals. Um, Sometimes state law prohibits them from doing these surgeries on children. Uh, But this law creates a sanctuary state, prevents any kind of subpoenas or court orders from other states to prevent uh, this from happening. Um, it's it's absolutely crazy. Uh, it, it, it's coming, I think, tomorrow. Do you guys have amendments that you're drafting uh, for this important legislation? Um, well, the, as we record, the amendment filing deadline uh, has pa- has just passed. So I don't know if any amendments um, were submitted or not. Uh, but I will say. I don't know what the purpose of an amendment to this legislation would be. This, this is the consummate um, pig that is not going to benefit from lipstick. Um, there, there is no, there, there's no conceivable improvement to this bill that would make it a better bill. It is fundamentally the most vile piece of legislation I've ever encountered, and that's saying something during a session where their house file number one was throwing open the spigot on innocent blood being dumped into a black hole of indifference, um, creating the most extreme abortion policy in the world uh, where we just carve out this jurisdiction of anarchy in the space of the unborn. Um, All this, by the way, under the premise put forward by Governor Tim Walz that he wants to make Minnesota the best state in the union for raising children and families. And so what are their priorities? Well, killing children, primarily. Number one, killing as many children as humanly possible. And then number two, any who survive House File 1, well, we're going to make sure that they're subject to being poisoned and mutilated. Um, and, And in the case of this bill, even in direct opposition to the stated will, of their legal parent, their legal guardian. Um, it's irredeemable. It's not going to benefit from an amendment. Well, um, as you were, you were speaking, I went to refresh the page for amendments and I do see amendments posted. The, the only two amendments to this bill came from representative Mary Franz. And, um, one of them has to do with, uh, it, it says gender affirming healthcare does not include the crime of female genital mutilation. Um, and the other one is an amendment um, that says that you can't do any, or that gender affirming uh, health care does not include treatments that for a minor may result in permanent loss of sexual function, permanent sterilization, or permanent change in the bone density or structure of a person's bone. Um, it's, it's kind of trying to take it to the extreme, um, and uh, Democrats are going to stand up and say, well, this doesn't happen or this won't happen. Yep. Um, but yet we're going to let doctors make these decisions and that we're going to take government out of, uh, you know, this wedge between uh, patient and uh, doctor, which is, you know, the Republicans arguments for trying to get government out of the uh, exam room. But um, but this is really about protecting children. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, Republicans would stand in opposition to an adult making stupid choices in their life. But uh, but this is about children and especially children uh, who are seeking these uh, changes that they see online and being promoted by the the, the crazy left um, in opposition to their parents. Yeah, it's it's a very difficult. Usually I don't have too much time or too much trouble coming up with something to say. Um, and there are a lot of I have a lot of thoughts in my head about this one. 
but it is a very difficult thing for me to talk about, even here, even in between you and me um, and our listeners, because it it evokes such primordial rage, as well it should. Um, and the difficulty that I have is that, you know, there's there's a lot of talk right now about violence, political violence, um, and the connection with rhetoric and what it means to incite violence, uh, and particularly around an issue like this, anything that's attached or even tangential to LGBT, um, one of their go-to defensive responses, um, which they quickly turn around into an attack is to accuse you, if you are in any way critical of anything that they want to do, to accuse you of inciting violence by speaking clearly and accurately about what it is that they're doing. And as as disingenuous as I regard that tactic that they utilize of trying to distract, trying to throw the smoke bomb of talking about violence and incitement, um, in order to distract from the reality of what it is that they're proposing. As much as I regard that as disingenuous, I do take seriously the responsibility that I and others in a similar position have to engage in the discourse and engage with these issues in a way that um, channels our anger in constructive ways. And that's the difficulty that I have with this bill is that it, it, it evokes such primordial, e like essential fundamental anger because it, this bill is the abuse of children. That's what it is. It's legalizing and, and not, not just any type of abuse, the most inconceivably heinous abuse possible. That's what this bill enables. Um, and, and, it, and it just, it doesn't just enable it. It doesn't just enable it for mom and dad to say, yeah, we're cool with mutilating our child. We're, we're cool with sterilizing them. Um, we're cool with poisoning them with unnecessary chemicals and biological agents. Um, we're cool doing that in order to chase down a fantasy and affirm a fantasy. It doesn't just say that. It also says that any adult, the language in the bill is adult acting as a parent, which, which means any adult can take a child from another state. So what the, a scenario that this bill allows for is um, often we hear about groomers. We hear about um, sexual predators online connecting with kids via social media and uh, grooming them and getting them to a point where they're willing to meet up with them so that the abuse can begin, the real abuse can begin. This bill enables that specifically directed towards getting the kid here so that we can chop them up and poison them. So once the kids across the border, their parent, their guardian will have no legal recourse in this state to get their child back. And they will have to sit and watch as that child is poisoned and mutilated by strangers. That's what this bill allows. So when I, when, when I contemplate, you know, how do you speak, how do you talk about that in a way that's respectful? How do you talk about that in a way that, that doesn't incite provocative emotion doesn't make people angry? And the answer is you can't. How, I can't talk about that in a way that doesn't make people angry. People should be angry. I am angry. I am horrified that this is something that I have to vote on. This, this is... This is like... I mean, I, I hate to use the analogy because it's so overused, but this is Nazi Germany stuff. This is Holocaust level atrocity. This is, you, you're talking about 
with state sanction. Yeah, and it's it's eroding um, morality from our society. It's it's all part. I mean, it's so many things that are happening around us to just erase gender, uh, erase parental rights. Uh, the state getting more involved in raising children um, and making decisions for kids. Uh, th- what kids are subjected to online through social media about trans- transgenderism, uh, it's just shocking. Um, Twitter, now that Twitter's under new ownership, um, there's a there's a bunch of Twitter pages for people that are that that were trans or thought they were transgender and then uh, realized they made mistakes after they had surgery or puberty blockers and they are going through this massive physical trauma that they're that, you know the parents put them through uh, because their parents at first you know hearing about their kids confusion pushed them through this trans transgender uh, path and you know chopped off their breasts and now they're I mean they're they're, they're permanently physically altered uh, and regretting this this trend, this decision, um, and it's they're amazing stories to 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 read, um, and uh, you know this type of testimony was notably absent from these uh, these bills as they went through committee. But you know, once you hear from someone who went down this path and realized it was a mistake and realized that they were wrong, uh, there's there's no turning back. They're 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 just they're broken as a human. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just really sad that this bill has got so much traction, the, uh, any opposition, you're just turned into this, you know, hateful person, but, uh, it's changing the laws of Minnesota on how we respect other states, uh, uh, court orders and, and, uh, and other things to try to, uh, protect parental rights of other states, uh, of people of other states. Um, and this is going to this is going to create a dangerous uh, trend in Minnesota and uh, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of children trafficked to Minnesota for surgeries. And uh, it's just, it's a sad state. Yeah. I mean, this is, this has to be unprecedented. Um, And we, we heard, we passed another bill passed off the house floor this week in regards to abortion law um, where it had a very similar effect where it says, Hey, um, if you commit, a crime in another state related to the killing of the unborn, that's cool. You can still come here. And not only are we not going to extradite you, we're not going to uphold and honor the laws of the other several states in the union. We're going to let you get licensed as a doctor, as a peace officer, as a teacher. We're just going to completely ignore the fact that you're a wanted criminal in another state. Um, This is worse than that. The, the trans, mutilation bill, the trans kidnapping bill that we're going to hear this week is worse than that because this sets up a situation where as a, uh, as a citizen, this, this, this legislation that we're going to pass, they're going to pass it um, here in the state of Minnesota impacts every citizen of the United States in all 50 states and U.S. territories. Because what it says is you no longer have parental rights in South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, any other state in the union. We are negating your parental rights in the state of Minnesota. And if your kid is physically brought here, either through their own agency or by being lured or transported by someone else, once they cross our state line, they don't belong to you anymore. That's what this bill says. The, the I mean, it, it's... Yeah. Like I say, I don't I don't know how to talk about it w- without becoming unhinged with anger. Because oh. that anger is justified. That indignation is righteous. This is people this is people destroying children in front of your face and asking you to like it. In, in addition to, you know, a lack of opposition from people that uh, wrongfully went down this path and have changed their mind, I have not heard much from the medical community speaking out against this. I mean, these <laughs> these surgeries are in direct violation of their Hippocratic oath that they took 100%. to do no harm, right? You don't take a healthy person and destroy them physically. Um, you know, there's a, there's a guy on Twitter, Dr. Blackman, that's been, you know, post, he's got, you know, a picture of him posing, uh, with, uh, what was, 
uh, a, a female and who's now uh, had, you know, breast removed to be non-binary and she's posing uh, with her, you know, without her shirt on with the scars you can see under her nipples. Um, and, the, and the doctor's giving two thumbs up. Like this guy should lose his medical license uh, for doing this, for performing the surgery. And uh, this is his specialty. This is just, it's, but you know, there aren't doctors speaking out. They're not uh, people in the, the board of medical practice talking about this. Um, it's just, and, and for some reason, sex change operation um, has been changed to, to be called gender affirming care. Uh, and that's just, you know, up to play on words, the Democrats are just, they're just changing the definition of this. It's just like, a, you know, trying to change abortion to being called healthcare. Uh, right. Abortion is not healthcare. It's the opposite of healthcare. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to pass the House. It's going to pass the Senate. The governor will sign it into law. And uh, somehow they're going to pass worse legislation so that the, the public, uh, you know, forgets about this. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the public... Maybe the public doesn't care. Maybe nobody cares. Sometimes it seems that way. Um, I mean, you you and I were talking just before we started recording. You were saying there's some folks who are looking at Republicans and saying, you know, why are you guys focused on all these social issues? Um, and first of all, we're not introducing the bills, okay? Like, these aren't our bills. We're not in charge. Um, if you want to talk to somebody about why they're, or ask somebody why they're focused on social issues, maybe ask the people who are authoring, introducing, hearing and advancing and voting upon and bringing to the floor these bills, because these bills are here as a, as a direct result and a sole result of Democrat priorities. They haven't given you a social security tax repeal. They haven't done anything about literacy. They're not doing anything to make schools better, to make it easier on school districts to manage their own affairs and administer education. They've done nothing on any of those fronts, but they've made sure that you can kill children. They've made sure that you can mutilate them. They've made sure that you can poison and kidnap them because that's what they're for. That's what they're all about. Those are their priorities. Yeah. Um, so the, the idea that there are people out there on our side who are criticizing Republicans for caring about this stuff, to me, that's that's an indictment that we deserve this. Our our society deserves this. Our state deserves this. If that's your if that's what we have on our side for for support is people who think that it's not we shouldn't be focused on whether or not kids get mutilated, then I <laughs> then I guess I'm not your guy. I guess I guess I thought I was in a different party because to me the priority is taking care of the least of these. To me, the priority is making sure that we're protecting life, making sure that we're protecting kids, making sure that we're standing up against evil and speaking out against it and speaking truth. That's what that's what being a Republican means to me. Apparently to you, it means a tax cut. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the the, the meme that sums up uh, this attack has got a picture of Elmo uh, labeled as a Republican establishment. And uh, uh, to his right is this a uh, group of vegetables that says actually shrinking the government. And then, in, and then to his left is a, a big pile of cocaine that says culture war bullshit. And it shows Elmo leaning over and just go into the cocaine. Um, you know, people are, people are upset. I think we got people in the, in the, uh, in the establishment in the middle Republicans, the soft Republicans that are saying, Hey, they're trying to focus on winning elections next year. And this isn't going to help that Republicans are so focused on the culture war and the, you know, Drazkowski talking about how he's never met, you know, starving children while they're passing just unprecedented amounts of money to feed children. When we know from the feeding our children program, feeding our future program, that there weren't kids lined up to get food. I mean, maybe right. we're missing the point directly, but, uh, you know, he was going after funding, uh, and, and he still gets criticized. But today or yesterday, uh, the budget for the governor came out, and this is usually an agreement that happens sometime in May because we have a divided government normally, but because they're all Democrats, they've compromised with each other and decided they're going to grow government by over 30%, which is on top of the COVID budget, which already increased government by about the same. I mean, our budget is absolutely out of control. They're growing government. And you and I talked about this, I don't know if it was on the show or offline a little bit, about how in two years, uh, they're going to run into a major deficit because they've grown government so enormously that we're going to have a deficit and they're going to, if Republicans do win the majority in two years, uh, they're going to come in here and have to make massive spending cuts. I mean, you're talking 
forty percent spending cuts to get back to pre-COVID levels, uh, or raise taxes, which Republicans, uh, you know, not they don't do either well, cutting spending or raising taxes. So, uh, what does that you know where does that leave us? It leaves us with what we talked about last week, which is that we're going to catch the hot potato eventually. Um, I mean, and just to touch back on you know the, these Republicans who are are claiming that it's somehow somehow a giant cocaine like distraction to talk about kids being abused and to focus on that as opposed to cutting government. Like what? I don't I don't understand what. Um, why do you want to cut government? Like why? To to what end? Do you want to have, cause, cause let me tell you what deal I would not take. Okay. The deal I would not take is cutting government by 50%. Like we're just going to cut it in half, but we're also going to kill unborn children and poison and mutilate them and let, let them be kidnapped from other States. I'm not taking that deal. Okay. It's, it's to me, it's a pretty vile concept premise that we care more about money and efficiency and waste, fraud, and abuse. We care more about those things than we do about children. That's why we lose, by the way. It's not because, oh, the, the Democrats are so great and we suck at, at, at what we advocate for and what we choose to talk about. It's because the things that we, and this is, this is particular for Minnesota. It's not true of Republicans nationally. And that's the other thing that ticks me off about this um, line of thinking is, Look, how do you explain DeSantis? How do you explain Florida? How do you explain Virginia and Glenn Youngkin? These are, these are guys who've leaned into the culture war stuff and they won as a result. So that right there onto itself completely disproves your premise. But then beyond that, the, the re, part of the reason why we're not taken seriously in Minnesota as Republicans is because we don't talk about how we care about people. We, we talk about dollars and cents as if those dollars and cents matter more than the people. And that's why people can't relate to it because that's not how normal people think. That's not how normal people feel. Normal people care about each other and they advocate for their values and principles and proposals from that basis. This is important to do because of the good it's going to achieve in people's lives. Um, and so to bring this back around to the budget, the reason why <laughs> what we're going to have in terms of what's facing us as Republicans is a, a lose-lose scenario. If we stay in the minority, then things are going to continue to get worse because we're not in charge of anything. We don't have any influence. If we somehow pull off becoming a majority again, then we're going to be tasked with dealing with the carnage resulting from the choices that are being made right now by Democrats, which most definitely is going to put us in a place where things are going to have to be cut. There's no doubt about it. Um, or God forbid, taxes might have to be raised. Fees might have to be raised either way, whatever it takes in order to balance things out, right? You have to, you have to decide what your priorities are. Now I've offered a framework, um, which could serve as a context for guiding us through that process. And I talked about it last week, sustainable stewardship, the idea that we're going to cap the state budget at five and one third percent of state personal income, um, that we're going to require supermajorities in order to raise new revenue. So we all have to be in it together. Truly all have to be in it together in order to raise taxes. Um, and also that if there is a state budget surplus, that we're going to return that to the taxpayer. So you do those three things, and what it does is it is it draws it draws the foul lines around the playing field, right? So it's no longer what we have now, which is this smorgasbord of anything that sounds good, we do it. You act, you're actually forced to to do what everybody claims that they do, but but never actually does, which is set priorities. What is it that we should be doing with government? What is it that we should be doing with the state? And then once you decide what those things are and you know what the constraints of your resources are, then you start planning accordingly. That's what we're going to have to do. Um, and it's we're going to have to summon the political will to do it. We're going to have to communicate why it needs to be done. And why it needs to be done should be fairly easy to communicate. At the end of the day, it needs to be done because we care about people. Because if... If you here, here's here's the worst possible thing 
we could do to our fellow Minnesotans. Promise them and ensure them, as the Democrats currently are, that we're going to take care of their every need. We're going to take care of them from cradle to grave. You come out of the womb, if you make it, if we don't decide one minute prior that you're worthless and not human and could be discarded in a dumpster like bio waste. Um, if you survive that process, the moment you come out, we're going to take custodianship of you. We're going to take stewardship over you. We're going to we're going to take care of your child care or your early education, your K through 12, your post-secondary. We're going to guarantee you have a job, guarantee you have some minimum level of income, provide for your retirement, provide for your long term care. You're, you're going to we're going to take care of everything. You don't have to worry about it. And people accept that offer and they go, yeah, that, uh, that all sounds great. That sounds like a great deal. I'll take it. And then we run out of money. And we can't provide any of it. And in the interim, people have made choices about how to conduct their lives based on the promise that they were going to be taken care of. And then all of a sudden, whoop, the rug's been pulled out from under them. And we've got swaths of people, swaths of Minnesotans throughout the state, worse off than they were before, certainly worse off than they otherwise would have been because of, pro of, of foolish promises that never should have been made and can't be fulfilled. Yeah. And, and they'll blame they'll blame government. Uh, let, let's jump into a couple of issues that we need to tackle that we may or may not disagree on. Um, probably we we'll probably disagree on these. Uh, you had you'd made a post about uh, protesters protesting in front of elected officials homes. Um, yeah, like there was an issue with uh, was it Mayor Fry in Minneapolis getting some protests, getting some heat. And uh, I know, you know, I've I, I, I'm a firm believer in uh, the First Amendment and being able to petition your government for redress of grievances. And when uh, your public officials don't go to work or they stay home or they are they're in hiding, um, I, I've always thought it was fair game to uh, to peacefully protest outside their house as long as you're on public property. But you disagree with that. You think that you shouldn't be uh, protesting in residential areas or we should have certain areas where you can and can't protest. Yeah, I don't think there's any defensible reason to have targeted residential protests um, for a variety of reasons. Basically, it comes down to the same reason that you can't uh, have an impromptu music festival on a random suburban block. Uh, every nuisance law on the books is predicated on the correct moral premise that each of us has the right to the peaceful enjoyment of our property. I have the right regardless of whether or not I hold an election certificate to go home and live in peace in my home. Your first amendment right does not entitle you to intrude upon that peace at all ever for any reason. If I don't want you there, you don't belong there. You better go. That's my stance. Um, and I think that if you personalize this, if you put yourself in the position of the person being targeted, you're, you're either, um, much more tolerant than the average bear of nuisance outside your home, um, or you're lying. Like that's that's kind of the two the two uh, positions that I see. Because you know, if imagine, um, and this was there's a, a podcast that Michael Broadcorp does with uh, Becky Allery and Jeff Kolb was on talking about this. That, that's how that's what prompted the tweet that you're talking about, um, and Kolb talks about an experience he had as a city council member in uh, Crystal, I believe is where he's from. And uh, he talks about an opponent of his in a political race coming to his house and taking pictures of his kids playing in the front yard. Um, that type of thing is gross. It's creepy. It's entirely unnecessary, has nothing to do with the political discourse. And there's, there's no, the, the only utility of it, I think this is kind of the core issue. The only utility of coming to somebody's house rather than sending them an email, making a phone call, leaving a voicemail, setting an appointment to meet them, protesting outside city hall or the Capitol or the rotunda or wherever, the only reason to take it to their house is to intimidate them um, because your, your house, your house is the one place you can't retreat from. I mean, we, even the, even the crazy gun control lefties recognize that, right? Like you, even under the worst of their proposed gun legislation, 
they still allow if somebody confronts you in your house and you're under imminent threat, you can use deadly force to protect yourself. So even the craziest leftist understands this concept that when you're in your house, there's nowhere to, to retreat to. You've already retreated. You're home. Yeah, but you're you're talking about um, you know threats of violence. Um, you know, I, I'm talking. I'm I'm defending peaceful protests. I'm defending standing outside someone's peaceful. house, st standing outside with someone's house with a sign that says "Stop killing babies." You know, you should be able to stand on a public sidewalk outside someone's house and protest their belief. Uh, I think you have a right to do that. And to say, well, you can't do this in front of elected officials' houses. You know, I went out and protested a, a whorehouse in Minneapolis one time, um, you know, with, with a bunch of people that we wanted it out of the neighborhood. And, you know, we have a right to do that. If that person was an elected official, uh, we, we couldn't do it in front of their house. I, I just don't think that you should, you should be able to uh, shield people that are elected and hold them to some different standard than, than everybody else in America. Uh, I think well, that... That's not what I'm proposing, and, and that's not a law I would or a bill I would support if that's how it was worded. What I'm proposing is that we ban targeted residential protests. So it doesn't matter whether you're elected or not. There are all sorts of reasons why somebody might be targeted for protest. Um, the reason why it's most associated with public officials is because they're public officials. They have high profile, they're dealing in public policy, and there's some degree of uh, political stakes in trying to apply pressure to them. But you know, it could be a celebrity, it could be a journalist, it could be, be a, a level three sex offender that that, that yeah. moves into the neighborhood and you don't think that you people should be out there uh, you know, talking to everybody that walks by and says, hey, watch out, there's a level three sex offender that lives here. I just think that it goes against uh, it goes against what our first amendment is is written for. Um, and that's just being able to speak your, speak your mind as long as you're not, uh, you know, hurting someone else. Uh, and it's not a direct threat. You're, you should be able to protest anywhere you want. That's public property. And it should, I mean, especially you're talking about this, this being in a state where Republicans are going to be in the minority here for the next decade or more. Uh, I don't, th you know, with the election laws that are coming through, I don't think, I think you're, you're advocating for allowing uh, Democrats to control our opposition to their policies. Uh, I just, uh, so uh, we, we can move on from there. I just, we, you know, if you want to give the last word on this. Well, I mean, um, first of all, I don't know that Republicans are primarily the ones who are going out protesting outside people's homes. Um, but regardless, the, 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 this, this is, this is where I'll leave it is, this is the same argument that I had with the BLM folks. Um, cause they, you know, with them, it was mostly peaceful protests, but it, it's this concept of what constitutes peaceful, right? So the, the standard that you're putting forward is that as long as you're not hurting somebody. And what I'm saying is that disturbing my peace is hurting me. Like it's not physically hurting me, but we have gradients of harm, right? Like you, you cannot, if you don't have trespass is a harm, it's a, it's, a tort, right? Like you can't just be wherever you want to be. That's, we have property and even public property has designated usage. Um, I, I went to a, uh, presentation and of a street racing task force recently, locally, very fascinating a topic for another time. But you know, this is dealing with these groups that get together, take over, that's their words, take over intersections in order to spin their cars around uh, rings of fire in some cases and barely miss pedestrians. Um, that's not why we build roads, right? Like you can't say, well, it's public property. I get to be there. No, it, yeah, it's public property for an articulated public purpose. And if your purpose is not within the scope of that stated purpose, then you don't belong there. Um, and so, you know, for me, the, the, and it's, it's very frustrating as a professed libertarian at heart. Um, because the First Amendment, the First Amendment is, is both ignored when it's convenient to ignore and abused relentlessly at every opportunity to defend activity that has nothing to do with speech. Like I said, the what you're trying to accomplish with your speech, you have many, many, many different avenues and venues to accomplish it. You don't have to be in front of my house. Okay. I mean, I, I just want to and clarify, I'm I'm talking about peaceful protesting, not 
not trespassing on other people's proper private property. Uh, but I think that there is a, a very slippery slope between saying we shouldn't be protesting in front of politicians houses to then declaring free speech zones where you can protest in little areas of cities and, uh, you know, being able to round up protesters. You know, when I was out protesting in front of Tim Walls's house multiple times, um, they were taught, there was talk about maybe we shouldn't allow this, you know, uh, but this is, is so important to get your voice heard and to advocate for change. Um, again, peacefully, right? Not destroying property, um, not blocking freeways, that kind of stuff. But, uh, but I'm, you know, I, I don't think that uh, curfews are constitutional when they do, uh, you know, lockdowns and, and uh, declare you can't protest at night or whatever. That's that's unconstitutional. Uh, but a good good conversation on that topic. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is uh, some election law changes that we see in the Minnesota legislature. There's been hearings on a bill to increase the percentage of votes that a political party needs to obtain major party status. Uh, currently, that law says you have to get 5% of the vote in a statewide election, and then you will receive major party status. Major party status brings with it um, the uh, concept of, or not concept, the, the ability to use public subsidies to your election. So Walter, when you won the primary in your race, uh, you got a big fat check from the Minnesota Campaign Finance Board, from the taxpayers of Minnesota to help you probably three or four thousand dollars to help you in your campaign. If you're not a major party, you don't get that. And so, uh, it, it, it uh, if you can get major party status, you can uh, help get your candidates elected. It gets you instant ballot access. So you just go down to the Secretary of State's office, you pay your fifty bucks or a hundred dollars, and you get on the ballot automatically with your party next to you. If you don't have major party status, you have to go out and collect signatures from a thousand or more people to get on the ballot. It's more work. And so raising the threshold from five percent to ten percent, which is the proposed bill, uh, would eliminate a lot of the major parties from uh, retaining or obtaining that major party status. It's basically a way for the duopoly, the Republicans and Democrats, to push out uh, the other parties. Now, in the defense of the bill, the bill's authors are mostly Democrat. Um, they are sick and tired of the two pot parties uh, cannibalizing their votes. And they think Republicans are using, are running pot party candidates that are really Republicans, but just to run them because they get instant ballot access, you just pay somebody a hundred bucks to go file in this race. And that pot party candidate usually gets three to 4% of the vote without even doing anything. And so that might be make the difference in tight races. Uh, Eric Mortensen's race in Shakopee, Tabke's race, uh, was, 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 uh, they've, they've been accused of running pot party candidates in that race to, to get uh, Mortensen elected. Jason Lewis, uh, one Congress, I was back in 2016 or 2014, uh, because there was a, a pot party candidate in that race, uh, Paula Overby. So is that the deciding factor? And is that the reason why we should change this uh, threshold for obtaining major party status? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I can only speculate. I haven't been on, in, on any of the committees where this bill has been heard. Um, and I haven't spoken to any of the authors about it. But at face value, it's pretty clearly just picking up the goalpost and moving it five yards further down the field because you don't like how far the running back got, right? Um, and that's just gross. Okay, I mean it's it's just that it's cheating. That's cheating. Um, when you you set the rules and then with the expectation of oh you know, we don't think anybody's ever actually going to achieve this, and then they do, they work hard and they get it done, and you're like oh well we'll just move the goalpost a little bit further and undo all your work because we don't like the results, it's pretty disgusting. Um, and I think it flies in the face of everything the Democrats claim to believe about elections and politics and democracy and representative government. Um, because they're, they're constantly on and on and on about the, the sacredness and value of democracy and listening to the people um, and, and letting, going wherever the people lead and what have you. Well, this is the people leading you, right? They're telling you, we want another option. We want a third party. Um, and in the, in the case of these pot parties, which you know, let me just say, like, I, it's fascinating to me that you could care so much about getting high that it becomes your number one centralizing animating issue that 
prompts you to create an entire political party focused only on that. That's just a fascinating anthropological observation. That that's <laughs> Not a thing only that, that <laughs> but there's two pot parties. It's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, I created a pot party last. Oh man, so did I. I thought I was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two parties: the legalized marijuana now party and the grassroots cannabis party, or whatever. You know, like yeah. there's two parties, and they've continued to co you know coexist for for quite a while. But well, and and if I had to guess, I'd say just like all factionalization, they probably hate each other and think that the other one's doing it wrong, and no, you're not pro pot enough, and blah blah blah. But at any rate. The point is that they have been able to utilize these parties in order to elevate their issue. I mean, House File 100 is evidence of that. Zach Stevenson is running around the Capitol with a bill to legalize marijuana. Now, it's not what either of those parties want, as I understand it, as testimony has been offered in committee. Um, but it's, I, I think it's fair to say that that bill would not exist if it wasn't for these pop parties and what they've done in elections over the past few cycles. And so what you're doing is you're eliminating a mechanism for a minority or a, a group that's just really passionate about a particular thing to have to elevate their issue and have it taken seriously. Um, and you're doing so, you're doing so, why? So that you can solidify your institutional control so that you can keep it a duopoly, as you say. And it's just really gross and anti-democratic, which is on brand. Yeah. And, and I'm, you know, I, I do appreciate third parties. Um, my first election, uh, when I voted for president back in 96 or something in my first election, uh, I voted for Ross Perot, who was a third party candidate because I didn't like Bill Clinton and I wasn't impressed with George Bush. So that's who I chose as my candidate. And I have voted for third party candidates since uh, several times. And uh, I appreciate the what they bring to races and how they change uh, the discourse uh, during a campaign. I want to see more of that. Uh, another bill that is gaining traction in the legislature is ranked choice voting, um, also called instant primary or instant runoff elections. Um, in the way, and this is a really complex bill. I mean, it's, it's uh, I think it's not being, uh, talked about in in a way that people can best understand it, but basically it it helps third parties uh, in this in the uh, race, which is interesting because this this raising the threshold from five to ten percent uh, hurts third parties. Ranked choice voting allows third parties uh, to get better to get more votes because it basically says, you know, I'm going to vote my my first vote is for a third party, but if they don't win, then I'm going to go with my major party, and it allows. Uh, you know, basically, if that person is eliminated in the first round, then wh whoever voted for that person will use their second choice vote uh, in, in the tally. And then it also makes sure that whoever wins an election has to get 50 percent of the vote. You can't have a race where there's four or five candidates and somebody wins with 30 percent. It's not a majority. So um, either way, it's been uh, hotly debated in the legislature. Republicans seem to be entirely opposed. Democrats although they don't like third parties, seem to be uh, pushing it because in, in certain races, they can run multiple Democrats against each other in a race and they don't see this. That way they won't cannibalize their own races. Um, but that looks like it will pass, but it will not be put into effect for the state races, the legislative races or Congress or the president. It'll only be allowed for municipal races and school board elections and that thing uh, for the first several years anyways. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, and I, part of the reason why I'm not a fan is I don't think it's being advertised accurately. Um, because like, like you say, well, whoever, whoever wins ends up having the majority vote. Well, not necessarily. If I fill out my ballot and let's say I only pick two people, um, then, and my, and my first pick is eliminated in the first round. And then my second pick is eliminated um, in the in the second round. Um, th my ballot's dead at that point. So the, whoever wins is whoever gets the majority of the remaining votes, not the majority of votes from people who cast ballots, right? So you're playing. You're you're kind of 
spinning this wheel of fortune that assumes that one of your candidates is going to make it to a later round. Um, and if they don't, then your ballot just doesn't mean anything. Uh, so I think that's a little disingenuous to claim that all oh, whoever wins automatically has the majority support of, of, uh, of the electorate. But then also just in terms of how it functions and um, what it promotes in terms of the way campaigns work and function, I see this as muting the voice of the minority. We just talked about the power that a third party that can only attract 5% of the vote has to influence the course of public policy. The, the marijuana now party or, you know, the, what, what, the, these two marijuana parties, they're never going to elect a governor, right? They're never going to elect um, a secretary of state. And they know well, that. Well, hang on. I mean, I, I want to play this one video uh, uh, for the listeners. Um, this is Governor Jesse Ventura testifying in committee against the uh, the bill to raise the threshold uh, from 5 to 10 percent. And, and listen to, to what he says. I guess I, I'll do this when I'm done. Yeah. I don't want to waste a moment. Um, first and foremost, I rise today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, I've done more testimony in this building in the last two weeks than I did in my entire four years as governor because you used to have to come and see me. But I'm here because this is very disturbing. I'm here in total opposition of this. And let me just state one fact. If these rules would have been in place back in 1998, the state of Minnesota would not have had a chance to elect Governor Jesse Ventura. Now, I'm sure that pleases both of the parties because I believe that's why this is being done, so that there can never be another Governor Jesse Ventura the people of Minnesota won't be able to shock the world again. We won't be on the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek for an election when I shocked the world. Because guess what? If this rule would have been in place, I couldn't have won. I was polling 8 to 9 percent at the primary. Because I had major party status through the Independence Party and my colleague Dean Barkley at 5 percent, I was allowed in the debates. I showed that within six to seven weeks, you could go from single digits to becoming the governor of Minnesota. If this rule was in place, that would not have happened. And let's talk about another thing that harnesses us third parties. We're the clean parties mostly. We're the ones that don't take PAC and special interest money, that that doesn't drive us. And if you, drive us out of, if you drive us out of getting public subsidy by rules like this, then that puts us in the same boat you're all in, the system of bribery that's been created by our governments run by the Democrats and Republicans. Yes, bribery. If you do it in the private sector, you go to jail. In the public sector, it's alive and well. I always tell people, if you're going over to meet with a congressman or senator, and they're Democrat or Republican, make sure you bring your checkbook, because that's the only way you're going to get an audience. How are you going to get money out of government by doing what you're planning on doing here and making it so the people of Minnesota won't get a chance to elect Jesse Ventura, the 38th governor of Minnesota, and I proudly say independent governor of Minnesota? Think about that a minute. You're all supposed to be for wanting people to vote. This is a sure way to do the opposite. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I would argue that that there could be a third party. There, there, there could be uh, an independent voice that that actually builds coalitions on both sides. And that's what the argument for ranked choice voting is, is now instead of just running. So right now, what we have in the primaries is you have people that win the primaries are typically the ones that are the furthest right and left because they go after the the, the, the the base, the low voter turnout in the primaries. And if you had ranked choice voting, you could have one election, which would be the primary and the general altogether. And they you're going to have coalition building. You're going to have people not tearing down their primary opponents, but actually working to say, look, if you want to vote for this guy, fine, but make me your second choice. 
because I'm, you know, and they, they build these coalitions. And so then you could have someone uh, from the middle actually win elections and that the, they, they claim that it's going to make uh, elections kinder and nicer instead of uh, people tearing each other down. So that, that proves my point. The, for as much as we, for some unfathomable reason, lift up the middle and moderates and centrists as somehow being automatically virtuous on account of not being able to decide what side of the spectrum they're on, um, the minorities are on the extremes. All those extremists, all those fringe radicals that everybody seems to be so afraid of, they're minorities. They hold views that are not broadly held by the rest of the populace. That's indeed what you just outlined in terms of like the feature of ranked choice voting is we want to get away from the extremes. We want to get away from the fringes. That's where the minorities are. And so my point is, is that in a republic, one of your objectives is to ensure that the minority has leverage to protect their interests. That's why we have things like separation of powers and, and separations of jurisdiction, theoretically, between the different levels of government. Um, because you, you want to be able to, you want to have a situation where a guy can be in a room of 100 people and he's the only guy who believes what he believes and they can't just elect to eat him, right? Uh, and the current system, while surely imperfect, has the virtue of allowing minorities to leverage their ability to organize uh, at a at a local level in a within the context of a political party um, to have their issue taken seriously and have their voice heard. If you dilute it by having a process that that it, its objective is to get away from those fringes and bring everybody to the middle then that person who really cares about raw milk or something that the rest of us look at him and go, what the hell are you talking about? That person's voice is never going to be heard because they're never going to matter. Well, I, I don't think that someone can campaign on and win an election just based solely on raw milk. But, uh, but if you had someone that that was part of their platform, they may appeal to both sides of the aisle um, who care about, you know, organic food and less government. Um, and I, I just think that it, if, if rank choice voting were to be implemented statewide in Minnesota, it would it would drastically change the style of campaigning that wins. The establishment uh, would have to shift gears pretty drastically. Um, I'm not saying I'm for rank choice voting. I just think that it's it's an interesting topic. And yeah, there's Republican states like Utah and Alaska that implemented it. And you know, Sarah Palin lost the special election in Alaska for Congress, but I think it was primarily because so many Republicans. Uh, didn't like the idea of ranked choice voting. It only passed by a narrow margin in, in Alaska. And uh, they were basically saying, well, I'm only going to vote once. And they voted for her on the first ballot and they didn't vote. They didn't fill in any other sl slots, even though there were multiple Republicans running. And so uh, Republicans lost that election. Uh, but I think it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's complex. It's needs to be, uh, we need to educate people if it's going to pass here um, and, uh, and change the style of campaigning if Republicans are going to win. But I think, uh, I think it helps third parties. It helps uh, minority parties, and uh, it would be—I don't know—it it, uh, look forward to, to to listening to more testimony as it, as it goes through the legislature. This the the bill I'm talking about, the bill that I've introduced, which is also uh, the number two on it, is Chair Moeller. Um, so it has bipartisan support. Um, is related only in so much as it has to do with towing, and that's also the reason why it's not going to be heard anytime soon because I have to try to engage with the towing industry and, and find out where they're at on this before we, we make too much movement on it. But what it, what it is, is a response to a constituent service issue that I had my first constituent service issue that I got the, the call before I was even sworn in. Um, and it was this gal who had her car stolen in Minneapolis. Uh, and then it was, it wasn't found by the way, it just was parked illegally by the person who stole it. And so it was towed. <laughs> and then they discovered because it had been reported stolen that it was her car. So they notified her and she's like, great, I'll come pick it up. And they said, no, can't do it. It's been impounded so that it can be uh, it processed for investigation. Okay, fair enough. Well, days go by, weeks go by. She keeps inquiring as to the status, gets no answer. Um, and then she is told, 
yeah, that investigation we were going to do never did it. Um, by the way, you owe us X number of dollars for towing fees and storage and the impound and all this stuff. And she's like, whoa, 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 wait. And that's when my, my office got involved. Um, and we started working with the city, um, basically rubbing their nose in it and being like, what are you guys doing? This is insane. You can't punish the victim of a crime for being a victim. This is nonsense. And that government being government, days and weeks go by. And eventually she gets the phone call from someone in the city saying, okay, fine. You can have your car come down and get it. Great. Problem solved. Sort of. If you forget the fact that she had to spend almost $4,000 um, in, in related expenses while not having her car. Uh, then she gets another call 20 minutes later. Same person. Yeah. So about that, we sold it. Sorry. They sold the car at auction. <laughs> and so then they told her, well, you know, if you file a claim with us, you might be able to get the proceeds from the sale. So not the fair market value for the vehicle, but whatever somebody was willing to pay for a stolen car that had been impounded for however many months. Um, so eventually she, she did get that. And so she got something for her trouble, but she certainly was not made whole. And so what this bill does is it takes that whole situation and says, never again where this is nonsense. You cannot charge a victim for being a victim. You cannot charge fees and it, for towing and storage of their vehicle. You can't sell their car. You can't do any of this stuff. Now, there are we had to be somewhat reasonable and put in some limitations on time. So, you know, we, I, I forget exactly what the limitations are, but it's very generous. Like if you're if you're doing what this lady did and you're trying to get your car back, you'll be able to get your car back. Um, but if you don't care for some reason and you leave your car there for six months, well, yeah, then they can sell it and recoup the expenses. So, wow. What a, what a, what a fascinating, uh, constituent services story about yeah. how just bad government is. Um, and you know, being in your shoes, you do get, you do get phone calls from people that are, you're just shocked at how, how much red tape there is and how much bureaucracy that, that uh, people have to deal with. And, you know, before I was in the legislature, I never contacted my state rep or state senator to help me with issues that, uh, but once you're there, you realize you do have uh, lifelines to all these different state agencies and uh, your title allows you to call some, you know, mayors of cities and uh, talk with them about stuff that you wouldn't normally think uh, you'd have the authority to do. So good for you and, and sounds like a good bill. Uh, we'll see. I'm sure those would be a fiscal impact note and all that kind of stuff, but uh, somebody has to pay for it. And uh, it's likely not going to be the criminal that actually did the carjacking or the car theft to start with. It's funny. It's funny you should say that because I'm pretty sure there is a provision in there that if somebody is charged and convicted with stealing that vehicle, they are responsible for the associated towing and impound fees. Yeah. Well, I, I had somebody uh, steal my mail nine times and uh, uh, caught checks and credit cards that were sent to me and uh, racked up about $12,000, drained my account. And uh, yeah, they... Technically, they still owe me, but you know they're never going to have money right. to make right. those payments, make me whole. All right, well, Walter, thanks for a great discussion on on several really important bills coming to the legislature, and uh, thanks to the listeners. We'll we'll uh, be on again next week to talk about more legislation, and thanks for listening to the Omnibus Podcast, where all subjects are germane. Thousand page <laughs> omnibus bills that that nobody knows what's in it. <laughs>